already know I do have a podcast called something dark and up until now it's just been an audio version but today is my first video podcast episode so welcome please excuse me if I'm a little bit awkward if I'm not looking in the right place I'm really really not used to sitting down with like a light and a proper camera um, usually when I'm recording my podcast episodes um, there's no video it's just audio recording and I'm usually like at night time sat in like a dark room with just my microphone so please excuse me if I'm a little bit awkward I'm going to be looking down at my iPad which has my script of the podcast just to make sure I don't get any of the facts of the case wrong um please excuse if you can hear any traffic outside um I'm filming this in the middle of the day and unfortunately our windows aren't that thick so they're not really blocking out that much of the noise so please excuse that so with all of that being said, I'm just going to get straight into today's case. On February 14th, 2017, two bodies were discovered near the Monon High Bridge Trail, which is part of the Delphi Historic Trails in Indiana. This was just one day after two young girls had disappeared from the same trail. The murders received a lot of media coverage because of a video and an audio recording of an individual believed to be the girl's killer that were found on one of the victim's phones. Despite thousands of tips that have been sent to the police and the circulation of the recordings of the suspect, no arrest has been made in this case. Today we're going to be discussing the case of the Delphi murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. To start off with our episode today, we're just going to go through a little bit of the background of the two girls. Abigail Williams, who was 13 at the time, and Liberty German, who was 14, both lived in Delphi, Indiana and they were both attending the local middle school. The two girls were best friends and they had actually met in school. They both played saxophone in the school band and this was something that actually really bonded them. Both of the girls were super close with their families, but Libby was known to be the more outgoing one of the pair and Abby was a bit more shy and more reserved. But it seemed that the difference in their personalities really complemented each other and only made their friendship stronger. The night before they disappeared, the two girls spent the evening painting together at a sleepover as they didn't have to go into school the next day. We're gonna skip ahead to the timeline of events as we know it. So starting on Monday, February 13th, 2017, both of the girls were off school for the day and they were really excited. They spent the morning at Libby's house with her family they had banana pancakes for breakfast and they helped Libby's grandmother with some things around the house. They didn't have anything planned, but they knew they wanted to do something fun. Libby checked with her older sister, Kelsey, what she was up to that day. Kelsey had to go to work and she wanted to stop by at her boyfriend's house as well. They decided to head out to the Delphi Historic Trails and specifically to an area known as the High Bridge. Libby asked Kelsey if she could drive them out there but because she had to go to work, Kelsey said that she couldn't. Eventually though, Kelsey agreed to drive them there as long as they could get a ride home from somewhere else. And Libby's dad agreed to collect them later on. The area the girls were heading to is known for its beautiful nature. And a lot of people visit this area for hiking, fishing, and just to spend time outdoors soaking up the wildlife. The two girls planned to take a nice walk and they wanted to take some pictures as well. At 1.35 p.m. Kelsey dropped off the girls and she told Libby she loved her and she watched the girls walk away. After dropping the girls off, Kelsey headed to her boyfriend's. At 2.07 p.m. Libby posted a photo of Abby walking the high bridge to her Snapchat. At this time, she also saved a video to her camera roll of a man walking behind them. This picture went viral back in 2017 and it even led to a lot of false accusations. The girls had only planned to be hanging out there for a few hours and they were supposed to be picked up at a specific location by Libby's dad at 3.30 p.m. Derek, Libby's dad, was waiting for them at 3.30 p.m. and they didn't show up. He thought they might be held up and he called Libby's phone a few times. Around 4 p.m., Kelsey had a few missed calls from her grandmother and she called her back and the first thing her grandmother said was, have you heard from Libby? Kelsey contacted her work to let them know she wouldn't be able to come in and she got in her car and she headed straight to the trails. At around 4.30 p.m. Kelsey arrived at the trails and met up with some family members including her uncle. 
She was hoping they would just be able to go and find the girls, maybe they'd fallen off the trail and they just needed some help, or maybe they had just gotten lost. As night fell and they still hadn't found the girls, the family called the police. The police and family decided to search the area together. They continued to search until about midnight when they called off the search for the night and headed home because of the rough terrain. At this point, the police said they didn't suspect any foul play. They believed the girls had either gotten lost or just decided to run away. The following day, search parties were formed out of family, friends, and members of the community. Word had gotten around about the missing girls and everyone was really quick to help. At 7 a.m., the search groups headed out. Drones and search dogs were called in and police even had a dive team called in to search the creek located under the bridge. Police tried to track the girls' phones, but it appeared that the phones had been turned off. Tips began to come in and one woman who was on the bridge at around the same time as the girls claimed she didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. The following day, on February 14th, Abby and Libby's bodies were found. They were found about a half a mile from the bridge on the north bank of Deer Creek and very close to the perimeter of a house. Multiple vigils were held for the girls and counselling was offered to students at the middle school. Autopsies revealed that the girls were murdered. The autopsy results are sealed and we do not have any further information on the cause of death for either girl. On February 15, 2017, Indiana State Police began circulating an image from Libby's Snapchat of an individual reportedly seen on the Monon High Bridge Trail, near where the two friends were slain. The grainy photograph appears to capture a Caucasian male, hands in pockets, walking on the rail bridge, head down and towards the girls. A few days later, the person in the photograph was named the prime suspect in the double homicide. On February 22nd, law enforcement released an audio recording from Libby's phone, where the voice of the assailant, though in some degree muffled, is heard to say, down the hill. For me, in this audio recording, I can hear guys down the hill as almost as if it's like a command to the girls. I'm going to play the snippet of the recording for you guys. I'm going to play it a couple of times. Guys. It was at this news conference where the recording was played that officials credited the source of the audio and imagery to Libby's smartphone and further regarded her as a hero for having the uncanny foresight and fortitude to record the exchange in secret. Police indicated that additional evidence from the phone had been secured but that they didn't release it so as not to compromise any future trial. By this time, the reward offered in the case was set at $41,000. On the 17th of July, Officers distributed a composite sketch of someone who at the time in the investigation was sought as as a person of prime interest in the murders. It had apparently been drawn by police from eyewitnesses to a certain hiker in the Delphi Historic Trails on the day that the girls had vanished. On April 19th, 2019, Indiana State Police announced a new direction in the case. On behalf of the State Police and the Multi-Agency Task Force, Superintendent Doug Carter released more materials a few days later in a press conference held on April 22nd. The new materials included a short video recording in which the blue jeaned and jacketed suspect is seen walking along the rail bridge for a little over a second. Superintendent Carter states that because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. An updated sketch of the suspect was also unveiled as well as an extended version of the audio recording in which a slight rise in the suspect's voice can be detected as he utters the word guys before the phrase down the hill. It was further explained that the previously released sketch showing an older man with a goatee and a cap is now considered secondary. By contrast, the clean-shaven individual of the newly revised composite is the primary sketch of the prime suspect. Police say this person may range between 18 to 40, but caution that his youthful appearance may be deceiving and could make him look younger than his actual age. 
On April 22nd, 2019, law enforcement reached out to the public, urging all to look at the sketch, listen to the audio, and watch how the man walks on the bridge, and send tips to this email, Abby and Libby Tip at CACOSHRF.com. Investigators revealed that they have reason to believe that the suspect may be hiding in plain sight, and that the person is almost certainly familiar with the area of Delphi, whether it be from living or working there, or for another reason. I'm gonna insert here the clip of the press conference from the superintendent, Doug Carter. Information is being released today is the result of literally thousands and thousands of hours of extraordinary investigative efforts by Delphi, Carroll County, the FBI, the Indiana State Police, and countless other agencies. This community surrounded us some 26 months ago, and you did everything you could to support us, but most importantly, you surrounded the family of these two little girls. Gosh, I'll never forget it. After you hear what we're going to release today, I'm going to ask for your continued support, your continued understanding, your empathy and compassion um, as, we, as we move forward uh, to find out who did this, and we will. We're seeking the public's help to identify the driver of a vehicle that was parked at the old CPS DCS welfare building in the city of Delphi that was abandoned on the east side of County Road 300 North next to the Hoosier Heartland Highway between the hours of noon to five on February 14th, 2017. If you were parked there or know who was parked there, please contact the officers at the command post at the Delphi City Building. We are releasing additional portions of the audio recording from that day. Please keep in mind, the person talking is one person and is the person on the bridge with the girls. This is not two different people speaking. Please listen to it very, very carefully. We are also releasing video recovered from Libby's phone. This video has never before been previously released. The video shows a suspect walking on the bridge. When you see the video, watch the, watch the person's mannerisms as they walk. Watch the mannerisms as he walks. Do you recognize the mannerisms as being someone that you might know? Remember, he is walking on the former railroad bridge. Because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. During the course of this investigation, we have concluded the first sketch released will become secondary as of today. The result of the new information and intelligence over time leads us to believe the sketch, which you will see shortly, is the person responsible for the murders of these two little girls. We also believe this person is from Delphi, currently or has previously lived here, visits Delphi on a regular basis, or works here. We believe this person is currently between the age range of 18 and 40, but might appear younger than his true age, di directly to the killer who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. For more than two years, you never thought we would shift gears to a different investigative strategy, but we have. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. We know that this is about power to you, and you want to know what we know, and one day, you will. A question to you. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do so. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done, or at the very least, they know because of how different you are since the murders. We try so hard to understand how a person could do something like this to two, ch to two children. I recently watched a movie called The Shack, and there's also a book that talks so well about evil, about death, and about eternity to the murderer. I believe you have just a little bit of a conscience left, and I can assure you that how you left them in that woods is not It's not what they're experiencing today. To the family. I hope that you all will give them some time 
because we're going to be asking that there's no media inquiry or no media response for at least the next two weeks, and I hope you understand why. The family found out about this, about this information this morning. I just want the family to know that when I take my last breath on this earth, I'll be thinking of them. There's going to be a tremendous amount of questions. I know that. I know that. Uh, never in my career have I stood in front of something like this. Please be, be patient with us. Please. Uh, we're just beginning. We are, we are just now beginning. And I can tell you on behalf of the sheriff and the police chief, so many other partners um, that have stood with us over this period of time, that we will not stop. I just unveiled the person that we believe responsible for the murder of these two little girls. So I invite media to take a look at that now. We're also going to show you a video not previously released that superintendent spoke to and also the audio that's additional to what's been previously released. It's only a slight change in it. <laughs> There is no sound of the video. An additional plea was made for help in identifying the driver of a vehicle left abandoned on the Hoosier Heartland Highway in Delphi at the former child service office between noon and 5 p.m. on the day of the murders. So moving on to the persons of interest in the case, I will mention I did get some comments on my podcast episode about this part saying that people wish I hadn't mentioned the persons of interest or the different suspects. Some of the people I'm going to talk about now are no longer considered suspects, and I don't believe the police have made their prime suspect at the moment um, public. So it is, imp I feel anyways, that it is important to go through any of the possible suspects to see how the police were kind of handling the case. Yeah, I just want to say that because there were some comments on the audio version of this case. So... Having said that, let's just get into it. One of the persons of interest in the case was Daniel J. Nations. He is a registered sex offender from Indiana who was arrested in Woodland Park, Colorado in September 2017. And he was charged with threatening strangers on a monument trail with a hatchet. The expired Indiana plates on the car Nations was driving was noticed by police who subsequently discovered an outstand outstanding warrant under his name. Fanning public speculation still further, it was reported that a bicyclist had been fatally shot on the same trail at around that time that Nations was a purportedly terrifying passersby. An El Paso County Sheriff spokesperson told reporters that however many similarities there were between the cases, he was not at liberty to disclose them since Indiana investigators did not want any more information released. On January 5th, 2018, Daniel was sentenced to three years of probation for threatening members of the public in Colorado. However, he was not released since he had an active warrant out on him back in Indiana. On January 24th, Daniel was transferred to Indiana officials' custody on a unrelated charge, failure to register as a sex offender. In February 2018, authorities said that Daniel Nations was no longer considered a suspect or an active person in the interest of the Delphi murders. So moving on from Daniel, we have Charles Eldridge, another person of interest. Charles was arrested on January 8, 2019 in Union City, Indiana, on charges of child molestation and child solicitation. Police in Randolph County alerted the FBI to a potential link between the Eldridge and Delphi murders on account of his strong resemblance to the suspect sketch. However, this was before the updated composite had been released. So that kind of wipes that out. Then there's Thomas Bruce. Thomas, who formerly worked as a pastor, is charged with fatally shooting one woman and sexually assaulting two others. After having ordered them at gunpoint into the back room of a suburban St. Louis shop for religious supplies. Committed in broad daylight on November 19th, 2018, these crimes put Bruce in the spotlight of the press. 
some noted his being of similar stature, five foot seven to five foot nine inches, to the then current suspect of the Delphi slayings. Also, his wearing a flat cap and navy blue jacket during his attack, not unlike the suspect in the Delphi case. Indiana State Police did look into the possible connection in November, and on December 4th, Bruce was charged with no fewer than 17 felony counts related to the St. Louis case and could receive the death penalty. There is a slight update from when I had first recorded the podcast back earlier this year in 2021. So on April 27, 2021, Indiana State Police detectives named James Brian Chadwell II as a new person of interest in the Delphi murders. In a response to a request from Libby's mother, countless homeowners across central Indiana have had orange lights installed in their front porches, both to commemorate the girls, but also to indicate that the murderer is still at large. In August 2017, the families announced their plans to build a sports complex for Delphi in memory of the girls. A nonprofit organization, LNA Park Foundation, was formed to celebrate and commemorate the lives of Libby German and Abby Williams by creating a place for the appreciation of nature, art, play, and athleticism for generations to come. A site was procured a mile north of Delphi, and in the years following the girls' deaths, continued progress has been made in the development of the Abbey and Libby Memorial Park. In 2020, the LNA Park Foundation was named a recipient of the NBA All-Stars 2021 Legacy Grant. That brings us to the end of today's case. Although not a lot of new information has come out, and the autopsy report is still sealed. The police seem to still be very focused on this case and focused to work towards finding the murderer. So if you have any case requests that you would like me to cover, please leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like the video if you like. Don't forget to leave a comment and subscribe. You can also ding the bell so you get a notification whenever I post. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you in my next video.